questions. Is this better? This is worse? That's better. Infinitely worse. It's on, it's on, it's on. All right. We're in business. Okay, we're in business. Uh, so, yeah, just general rules uh, or questions. You don't ask personal things as far as uh, autographs and, and photos and wanting to come up on stage and none of that kind of stuff. Just talk about the show and and uh, ask your questions about the show because that's what we're here for, of course. Uh, and you're not here for me. You're here for the cast and, the, and Jane Espins and we'll get me on in a second. But first, let's look at our Geppetto, Mr. Tony Amendola. And uh, if you're in trouble, you don't know right from wrong, give a little whistle to Raphael Savart. <laughs> He was dreamy and he was grumpy. He's Lee Ehrenberg. <laughs> and as I said before, Dragon Con, uh, Harley does, he needs to introduce a uh, writer for Buffy, the Vampire Slayer, Battlestar Galactica, uh, Dollhouse. You can go on and on and on. She's got a web series, Husbands. She's doing everything. She's also, of course, working on Once Upon a Time, Jane Espenson. And we will be getting to those very shortly. Uh, so I just want to first set the stage. Um, about a year ago, the show they do back in September uh, had an amazing story, amazing special effects, a new take on the fairy tale genre, of course. Uh, so how, if you look, sort of going down the line a little bit, how did each of you guys first find out about the show and, and your involvement in the show? How did that work out? And what was your first feelings about this, this concept? Sure. Go ahead, sir. Uh, you know, for me, I, I have to admit, it was it was just another audition. And my agent said, I have an audition for this pilot for you. And uh, I thought, oh, great. And OK, it's a fantasy thing. And this is uh, Geppetto and another guy. And I, but then I went home, and he sent the script. And I read the script. And I said, whoa. Uh, it's really, really sort of wonderful, which is dangerous if you're an actor in a kind of way, because you don't want it too much. You don't want to be a part of it to get in, in the way of your audition because you think okay this is something I want to do and that happened with this script I have to admit and it was a peculiar audition uh, because in the pilot there really wasn't that much for uh, Geppetto to audition with so the casting person gave me a whole other sort of scene from a f different material and I auditioned with that uh, and so it was uh, I was really thrilled to get it so and uh, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it so uh, and didn't you have to carve a block of wood? <laughs> <laughs> he had to carve a block of wood. <laughs> Which, whichever actor made a living puppet got the part. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just I, just as Tony's talking, it's just a, a wonderful thing uh, because Tony and I have known each other for 25 years plus, and uh, we're both in a theater company in Los Angeles. And and when I heard that my best friend on the show was actually a dear friend of mine. It was so <laughs> it thrilled. Was it was just sort of a, a, a total coincidence. So yeah. uh, we, have, uh, we have chemistry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it made, it made um, sense. Yeah. You know, uh, to, picking up on what Tony said, having read the script the first time, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. But it'll never work. I mean, they'll never be able to make it work. I mean, come on, this is too good. I mean, on the page, it's fantastic. And, and how can, it's so ambitious. And then we were all invited to a screening. Um, uh, the executive producers uh, invited us to a screening at, at, a, at a big screening room, and, and we all sat there, it was just a cast, and we watched it, and we all sort of were slack-jawed and, and literally just knocked out. Uh, holy smokes! It's even better than what had, had, was sort of on the page. We were just sort of amazed and thrilled. It sort of far ex exceeded our expectations, and, um, and it has 
over and over and over again. I, I mean, I am. I can sort of say this. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the show. I love this show. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, one of the things that really turn us on as actors is good material. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're, as, we're only as good as good material. Like, if you give us a great script, even decent actors look damn good. <laughs> and, and, this, and this stuff jumped off the page. So, I agree, Tony, it was a job I wanted. You know, I mean, I played pirate for Disney and I'd done some other stuff for Disney, so I'm, I'm down, I'm down, I'm down with, um, you know, the association with like, these are stories that are your stories. And what's brilliant about what they've done with this and with this material is they let it be what you know to be true about the characters. And then the beginning and the end, they stay true to the fairy tale and it's the middle. It's the stuff that we don't know in the fairy tales is that's what's going on in Once Upon a Time. And that's what really thrilled me, and that's what I think they've done such a hell of a job on nailing it, and why we're all so thrilled and excited. And um, yeah, it's an honor to be a part of this show. It really is. It's a thrilling ride, and we're so glad that you guys have elevated us to uh, a second season. <laughs> This is one of the areas in which actors and writers absolutely have the shared experience. You read the material and you say, this is a good show, I want to be on it. Oh my God, now I want to be on it, now what am I going to do? And I, I went in and met with Eddie and Adam and uh, discovered they were Buffy fans. Wow. <laughs> this is a turn of luck. Um, and so I was very happy to get the offer to come to come join the staff. And, and yeah, it's in that Buffy, the thing that we did at Buffy, these guys respect and do really well, which is that they're always thinking about what is the reason to tell this story and what is the emotional, emotional journey for the main character of this story, the, the, what we used to call the what's the Buffy of it. And these guys get that. And so that has, that has made, I've never regretted for a second taking this job because it, and then it's a hit. Like normally I go, I never regretted taking this job despite the cancellations. <laughs> but a network hit, that's crazy to have something this fresh, this concept, this uh, flexible and yet focused and, and to have it be a hit is uh, wonderful. Uh, it's just great. And we have questions out there. Questions? Hi, this is for Jane. Hi. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, I just had two really quick questions. So, where can I find you for autographs? Because I have been trying. And um, is there going to be any queer canon coming up at all? Um, for autographs, I did my two autograph sessions this morning and, and noon, but I've got a panel tomorrow morning at, uh, I think, 10 o'clock uh, for husbands. And if you come to that, we'll make sure that you get a chance to meet me and the guys, and I'll sign something for you. Um, we'll work something out. Uh, queer Canon, you'll have to keep watching. <laughs> I actually asked what I could say about that and was told to say, you'll have to keep watching. <laughs> Hey, sorry guys, no flash photography. I forgot to say that out before. Hi, I just want to say I'm a huge, huge fan of the show. And one thing that I love about the show is that I care about the characters in a way I never thought I would. And I was just wondering, what is your favorite part of doing the show since it has this core to these characters that everybody knows that we never had a chance to look at them in this way before? I mean, we, uh, two is, uh, the, the thing that's so thrilling about what, again, the writing staff, what Lee just said is just in terms of the writing being smart and um, it never panders and it always kind of uh, uh, is surprising. Um, you know, I had so many people walk up to me and say, God, I never realized that that was Jimmy Cricket's backstory. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I, and I take the compliment. And the dwarves come from eggs. Right. <laughs> They made this stuff up, right? Um, and, and, but they make it seem like, of course, of course, of course they come from eggs. Well, I mean, yeah, I think too is that, you know, the, within the scene, the scene structure, um, new things will be revealed about the characters, but at the same time it'll always go back to, like, say, for a Grumpy, 
it's always going to come back to some smart ass comment, you know? And, and I think that ultimately that's, that's what's thrilling for us is that, um, you know, we make the emotional investment. This is a dangerous business we're in, you know? Uh, as actors, what we get paid to do is make dangerous choices, not only physically, but emotionally vulnerable choices. And that's what you respond to. And that's what the material demands. And so, for us, I mean, we love to work with each other. We've been lucky that we all get along and that we all hang out off screen and it shows up on screen because we do care about each other. So when you see me love on Ginny Goodwin, that is a lot to do with Lee loving on Ginny Goodwin, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it's funny for me, uh, because, you know, we have stories where we're there and then they tend to write a story that deals specifically with the character. And so it was very easy for me in the uh, uh, Stranger episode because essentially they reduced it to an immigrant story. You know, and, and, and what, what would you bend the truth for? What would you bend your loyalty to? And you would bend it for your children. You'd do anything for your children. And there was a real hunger. And it, it, it touched me personally in a, in a kind of way uh, for that, the notion of sending a personal way now you know it's funny i was talking backstage now no matter where you're from in the world you know it's pretty much easy to get there you know it's really not a problem and and, and if it's not that you know noble.com you're talking about three cents a minute the talk on the phone but the notion of, of just 100 years ago or 80 years ago 60 years ago of sending a child to a to a new world to america if you will to storybrook was a huge thing and you wouldn't see them again you know and and you know there's sort of part of my background that remembers that and so it was really, really potent for me. And, you know, to have sort of Raphael re trying to put me on the straight and narrow about that. And, and there was a fierceness they created in Geppetto's character that I thought was great. And oddly enough, uh, several friends in Italy sort of um, emailed me and they were sort of delighted because generally Geppetto is this sort of, you know, sort of slightly foolish, sort of older guy. And they said, oh, finally, you, someone, you know, latched down to a kind of fierceness within and the need to protect. And I thought, thank God, good, I'm glad you saw that. And, uh, and, and it was fun to act. So it, it wasn't as much a a present that you, you just simply take from the page and you give, uh, you know, to a TV audience. It was truly something the actor could open and go, oh boy, okay. And so they it also, was easy. Yeah. And also, too, it's something great that you said, too, and this, I feel like when you read these scripts, we're always, we don't know what's going to happen, right? So that script will come from, like, <laughs> permission of Eddie and Adam, here's your copy. Yeah. And this stuff resonates. Like, when, you, when it's your story, I'm going to guarantee you're crying when you read that stuff. I, I couldn't stop crying when I got my story. <laughs> when, I, when I read the dreamy thing, dude, I'm bawling, you know? Because yeah, yeah. I'm going to get to make out with Amy Acker. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have two favorite things that I love about what we do, and I'm sure if I sat here longer, I'd find ten more. One of them is that we find emotional, motivated explanations for why fairy tale characters do the things they do, which are always sort of under-motivated. You know, why is, uh, why, why would a person go after power when they could have love? Oh, because they have fear. It's like, that's a really deep sort of psychological truth. You apply it to Rumpelstiltskin. Rumpelstiltskin has always been as this sort of, sort of very unmotivated character who's all about like, if you know my name, you can control me. And then says his name out loud. <laughs> like, it's like, so let's, yeah, let's figure, figure out, what, let's take Rumpelstiltskin seriously. What would drive a person to be this sort of trickster? Like, oh, this, figure out a way to make it make sense. The other thing I love is when we do mashups and we put characters together and sort of reveal that they were in the same story. Um, the, oh, it's Beauty and the Beast, but Rumpel was the Beast. Or, I bet you didn't know that Prince, uh, Snow White's Prince and Cinderella's Prince knew each other. Like, all that stuff. I love that when you sort of go, oh, the world, the world had people whose lives crossed the way they do in the real world. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's, it really is as if these characters inhabit the same world. Yeah. So that, you know, when we're in, we're in the fairy tale world, yeah, I mean, Grumpy works with uh, Charming. There's, right. there's backstory. And we pick up kind of mid-story. It's very late point of attack. It's a classical theater technique where you start after the action's kind of happened. And then, then they'll telegraph it back. And what's masterful, I think, is the way that they manipulate all of us the actors, the writers on the staff, and certainly the audience into, into feeling these emotions. 
And it's that it's that stuff I think that resonates with you guys and what turns you on and why it's become must see kind of television. What a lot of people have said too is that they were very concerned going into this when they said, you know, this is Disney and it's fairy tales and it's ABC. Some people said to me, oh God. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to watch that. And, um, uh, you know, the story that I tell a lot when I went to my audition for this part uh, was I asked the guys, do you want a Jiminy Cricket sound alike? And, and, and they had a very simple response. They said, no, we just want it real. And um, I, I feel like that is kind of the sort of the, the, the thumbprint or the what, what they have really given all of us in a way they've given all of these characters an extraordinary amount of respect. They have self-respect as well as, and also, um, uh, they're not pandered to either in the playing or the writing. And as a result, I think that's why we care about them. Um, I, I mean, I find that when I watch and I care about these guys. Yeah, I think anyone who dismisses our show as being for young people or young and any are missing all of the direct sex and rock and roll references. <laughs> <laughs> you got some more questions here? No offense to Geppetto who just made the case on why you sent a seven-year-old uh, child with a baby to another world and they were scared and he shirked his responsibilities and left her alone to grow up without her parents. Um, but anyway, um, I, was, uh, I came away from The Stranger thinking Geppetto was a real jerk. <laughs> Good. And um, I was wondering if there was going to be any fallout from that now that people in Storybrooke know who they are and know what happened maybe with the wardrobe, and um, if there was going to be something redeeming about Geppetto, because I want to like Geppetto, because Once Upon a Time has done something that is, I've never done, and that's actually like Pinocchio characters. So I would like to like Geppetto again, but I okay. don't know how. Well, <laughs> number one. <laughs> there, are, there are therapy treatment programs for this. <laughs> number one, you know, that's... That's the reason why you have to watch the second season. <laughs> That's what's called a hook. <laughs> that we need to get you back. And number two, you know, I, I really, yeah, of course, as an actor and, uh, uh, you know, a, a fan of the show, I, I would like you to like me. But I, I don't need you to like me all the time. And, uh, and I actually loved the fact that there was, so, you know, we're human beings. We are capable of anything. The great thing, you know, for an actor, they you know, they used to say, if you can kill a fly, then you can imagine yourself killing a human being. There, there is, we are capable of anything, and it's all within us. Uh, and it's just a matter of getting to it. And, and often in acting class, Raphael and I had a similar acting teacher. He, he used to talk about the uh, the smell of goodness in an actor, which was the the need to be liked. And, and he would he would talk against that that you really need to go against that and consequently I, I you could look at it that way with Geppetto that he sent a uh, a child uh, a young boy into the world with a baby or he, it was the need to make this child his survive and and not just hang around and you know and I believe that 100% I'm I'm behind that I think if you ask yourself as a parent anyone who is a parent in this room I think it's there. Uh, in us, and so I have no problem with that. Now, if they write six or eight episodes to get you to like me again, I wouldn't mind it. <laughs> More questions? Yes, this is Raphael. Um, are we going to see uh, Dr. Hopper in a bigger role this season? Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm told that there's lots of new things coming. Um, I, I, uh, I'm not entirely able to say, uh, answer the question, but I only because we're, we're not supposed to talk about it. But I, I can say that a lot of people have asked me that. Um, and uh, I, I take it as a compliment. I thank you. <laughs> you got other folks? Hi, my question's for Lee. As an actor, when you open a script and say, Oh, eggs, hatch fully clothed, ready to go. <laughs> what does it take for you to get there and make that authentic? Mm. <laughs> you know what, I, I go for it, guys. I mean, the way I look at it is, um, you know, it's a puzzle. Each scene is a puzzle. I, I, I'm in class every week, you know, I study. I go to my coach, I think about it. But at the end of the day, I just, look at the words on the page and say them. 
And then I say him, and then I say him again, and I say him again. Tony Hopkins, you know, he used to teach his acting class in this laundromat in Santa Monica. He like these hot chicks, and uh, I heard about it, so I used to go there, just hang out and have a coffee with like Sir Tony Hopkins, and listen to what he said. And he had this thing where he would do his lines aloud in his room 200 times before he ever went to the set. Wow. And 200, man, I tried to do it 25 times, right? That's a lot of repetitions. He would always do it aloud so that he could hear it in his mind's ear what the character would say. Then by the time he gets on the set, Jane's not going to like this, but I've never gotten a job by getting all the lines right. And honestly, it doesn't even matter what I say. It only matters how I say it. So what you do is you run these permutations, you go through it a bunch of times, and then on the day, you just look the fella in the eye, try not to hit the furniture, hit your mark, and get the hell out. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I swear, I've met actors, guys. I've met actors. I had a buddy of mine, Faustino, plays uh, my brother Sleepy on the show. He had a two-line part on, on the killing, and he was super excited. I mean, this was his first role play in Sleepy. He comes to my room up in Vancouver, stoked about his performance and working on the killing in addition to being on our show. And he's like, oh, I changed this, and I thought about this, and I did this. And I, and I looked at him, and I go, dude, do you realize that you've thought more about the two lines on The Killing than I did three pirate movies, all my Seinfelds? Uh, you know, I just, I'm lucky. I just plug it in and go, man. And I trust that everyone else is going to help me shape where I get to. It's a team effort, what we do. You know, and we just happen to be the lucky guys that stand in front of the camera and get a lot of the credit. But what we do is a big team effort, and TV is a lot about, it's always led by writing, you need 22 badass scripts. Then you hope your director understands what the writer's intent is, and then you just hope that the studio gives you the budget to shoot what they want to shoot. So, just go for it, don't think about it. Let her rip, baby. <laughs> Jane, very quickly, are, do you have uh, certain characters that are tortured characters like Jimmy Cricket and, and Rumpelstiltskin? Is that sort of something you're, you're interested in writing, or is that something you're drawn to? Oh, to write pre-existing characters and make them, and figure out ways to make them real? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I love that. That's one of my favorite things. It's like, you know, it's been a very long time since someone has typed the words Jimmy Cricket. Which, <laughs> like, now, okay, now dialogue. Okay, what does Jimmy Cricket say? That... Who writes for Jimmy Cooper? I love that. Uh, I love being able to delve into a classic character and yet figure out how to make them make sense. And uh, yeah, that's a huge thrill for me. And that was, I got to do it on, um, on other shows. I wrote um, an episode of Buffy in which Hansel and Gretel appeared. Uh, and I got that same sort of thrill there of like, like these, are, these characters already exist in some form in people's minds and, and how, how cool to, to make them real. The thing that's been exciting for me too then is uh, because these Disney characters have been around for so long is that I, I found, maybe you have as well, that the, the range of um, the demographic, as they say, yeah. is sort of 8 to 80. Um, yeah. I mean, my kids watch the show with me. Um, uh, they're uh, 7 and 9, just turn 8 and 10. Um, and, um, I, you know, we, we huddle up on Sunday nights and watch the show. But, you know, my mother is 80, and she grew up with these characters, and uh, 